So, uh, welcome to this webinar on FAIR data for heritage science organized by the Swedish National Heritage Board and Uppsala University Library in collaboration with Swedegard, more on which later. We are very gratified to see such a large and varied group of participants. My name is Åsa Larsson and my background is in archaeology and osteology. But for the past eight years, I've been working at the Heritage Board with digitalization and archaeology uh, of, of archaeology and cultural heritage and how to make this information useful to researchers and specialists in particular. Barbro. Yes. <clears throat> so Barbro Bornsäter. Um, I'm a librarian at the Uppsala University Library. Uh, but up until very recently, I was uh, a research data advisor at the National um, Swedish National Heritage Board, uh, working with us on this project. So that's why we're, we're doing this together now. My background is, as you can see, within uh, the natural sciences. So I'm a paleontologist. So geologist slash biologists background, um, which is, um, it comes in handy because it uh, gives you a, a researcher perspective on these things. And I will also touch upon why it came in handy in this particular project, actually. Uh, so more on that later. Great. So this presentation will start with an overview of open science and the fair data principle before we move on to control vocabularies and linked data. We will then present the research and development project, uh, which we recently completed, and the results it yielded. We will end with reflections on some more intangible results from the project, insights and thoughts regarding the challenges with implementing fair data processes for cultural heritage researchers. We will hold off on answering questions until after the break. You can write uh, questions at any time in the chat during the presentation, or you can ask them yourself after the break. We also hope to engage you in a discussion about verifying cultural heritage and research data and hope to hear about your own thoughts and experience in this area after the break. So I now hand over to Barbara to start us. Thank you. <clears throat> so just to get us started upon this whole thing, why, why we're doing this, why we've done this project, um, is because uh, open science and fair data uh, is not just something new and that is in at the moment it's basically the new way of working in in science um, and the thing is that uh, it has been talked a lot about uh, open access in the past years that we want to publish openly publish uh, and then we're talking about our articles scientific papers um, and for from the past few years uh, or actually more than few, um, it's been more and more it's been increasingly uh, interesting to also talk about sharing other things that the only output from research is not actually the uh, the written article, but also everything else that is included <clears throat> in a project. And as you can see on this lovely illustration that I love to use for for all of talks that I talk when I talk about open science, is that we can see that it's also about uh, open source uh, programs uh, like computer programs, software, open infrastructures. We're talking about uh, citizen science. Um, we're talking about crowd sourcing. Uh, we want open labs with open notebooks and we want open data. And that's where the the fair part of this comes in, which I will go into in just one one moment. But to touch upon this and to, to uh, also um, link it into current uh, actions is that, um, so we've talked a lot about like open access to, to um, articles uh, recently. Uh, only a couple of days ago on May 5th, uh, the EU uh, sent out a new um, proposal or uh, information actually about the fact that the EU is now uh, ready to agree uh, upon, which is nice that they agree, uh, agree that uh, immediate open access to papers uh, reporting publicly funded research, research should become the norm without authors having to pay fees. Uh, and that's interesting because as what we've had now is that open access has been the new norm for quite some time, but the fact is that authors have been paying for publishing their articles instead of the readers paying, which was the norm previously. Uh, but now the EU is saying that they are actually um, ready to stop to stop this which means that the publishing society the publishing process will change completely uh, and this is a very interesting um, aspect in this whole open science game um, but that was just like a little uh, addition that i added in this morning because i find it interesting that there are things happening as we speak about this so if we can go to the next slide also we can talk a little bit about um, 
uh, open and fair again. So uh, EU's open data directive speaks about these things, <clears throat> that the, the research data that is generated uh, is growing. So we have more and more data all the time. Uh, and it also speaks about the fact that it needs to be accessed, that it's not only the, 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 res the only result of research is not just the publication, it's actually all of these things in the data as well. So it's become crucial and urgent to be able to access, blend and to reuse data from different sources. Um, and that's where the FAIR principles come in, as we can see here in the second part, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable uh, data. And we have a Swedish quote here, which I also have in English, uh, which is from the Swedish Research Council. Um, <clears throat> and the Swedish Research Council recommend that research data financed via public funds and that applicable legislation allows to be published, of course, should be published openly, accessibly on the Internet within a reasonable time after the research has been, um, been, been published. Um, so this is something that is also important. This is important in, in the EU, this is important in the world and also in Sweden. Uh, the goal to complete this transition to open data is to have it finished no later than 2026, uh, which is very soon. Um, and we can say now that it's maybe not super likely that it will be all done, but that's what we're working towards. And that's also part of why this project that we have done happen now, because this is this is things that we need to deal with. So we can take the next slide and talk a little bit more about the FAIR principles. Uh, so as I said, FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data. Um, so if I'm a researcher and I want to see what other people have done and see if there's something that I can use, I want to be able to find uh, the data or the documents or images or whatever it might be, uh, codes maybe as well. Um, I want to be able to access and to download that information uh, if, if I can, if it doesn't contain sensitive uh, data, for instance. And I want to be able to combine the data from several different sources. Uh, and also I want to know, of course, how I can reuse and publish what I find, what I have found, which means that I also need to know about licensing and how, how I'm allowed to use this. Um, and these principles came about in 2016, uh, so they're not super old, uh, and they were uh, published in scientific data uh, by a group of people that had just basically sat down and had a meeting and talked about how are we going to do this? How are we going to have, what kind of guidelines do we need to have to make this happen? Um, and um, so that basically that was the goal of the authors to provide these guidelines to be able to do this. Um, and these principles very much emphasize machine actionability. So which means the capacity of compute, computational systems to find, to access, to interoperate and to re, re, reuse the data uh, with none or with minimal human intervention. Uh, so it's not about that we as humans should sit and search through information, but we need to have information that a machine will be able to find for us. Uh, so that's one, one important part of it. But it's also important to remember that the FAIR principles, these are qualitative goals. They're not like absolute. This is not like we need to have it exactly like this. There is there is wiggle room, but this is what we need to work towards, basically. So next slide, please. Um, so, I mean, what are the good things about this then? I mean, obviously it's good for someone who is doing research and they want to uh, find data and be able to use it. But the thing is that it's also something that benefits the researchers that has produced the data or the person who produced the data. Um, because what, what I would like as a researcher is for uh, other researchers, my peers, to find the work that I've done and to understand it and to be able to add to it, to build upon it, to increase it, to use it in their research um, and definitely to be able to cite and to credit because this is something that is crucial because if we are now changing the entire the entire um, scientific community in the way that we get credit for our work as researchers. 
um, that means that we need to find new ways to get credit for it as well. If it's not only the finished article that counts, uh, then obviously we need to be able to get credit for all the other things as well, uh, so that it's not the most important thing, maybe doesn't have to be anymore, what impact factor the journal has that I'm publishing in, but also how much data I've actually shared and uh, how that has been reused. Uh, how many times has the data been reused? That could be like a, a very important thing in the future. Um, so we can go to the next slide, and I believe I'm handing over to you, Osa. Yes, uh, so I will be talking a bit more about controlled vocabularies and linked data and how they relate to the FAIR principles. So looking deeper into details of FAIR principles, if anyone has done that, that can feel, be, feel very technical and quite overwhelming. Uh, but for individual researchers, most of it comes down simply to the use of good standardized terminologies from vocabularies and the use of rich metadata. Uh, it's not everything, but it's quite a lot. So that's why we want to spend some time on this and explain how this can help you and your research. So it's important to realize that research data is not just data sets. Any research output that forms the basis on which analysis and interpretation is made is research data. That includes photographs, illustrations, diagrams, geodata, tables, calculations, etc. Unfortunately, machines are very, very stupid. They, unlike humans, they don't really understand what's in most of this output, only structured data and text. I'll we'll leave AI at the side for the moment. But in general, that's the only, what, the only thing that they understand. So in order to make research data machine readable, and especially to make it findable, we need descriptive metadata. And the more descriptive metadata, the better. Uh, the more standardized this metadata is, the easier it is for machines to understand what, what you are looking for and, and how to find it. So in order to use, uh, to make yourself comprehensible, both machines, to both machines and to your peers, it's, uh, it's very good to use standardized terminologies. And you can find such controlled vocabularies online. Sometimes they're called the thesaurus. Sometimes they're called ontologies. They can uh, kind of many names. However, uh, a controlled vocabulary, uh, terms within it are only unique inside its own context. For instance, it could be for general concepts such as Roman or textile, art history, a church weapon, and it can be specific persons or sites or artworks or species, uh, such as John the Third or Birka or the Mona Lisa or uh, Pinus Silvestris. However, if you take these outside of their context, they can sometimes be confused with other things. They can have other similar ways of, of calling it. There are several different John the Third, for instance. So if uh, a vocabulary has a unique identifier for each term. Uh, a term. If this can be called an authority, especially if that uh, persistent identifier, persistent unique identifier, is in uh, in the way of a web link, so that it's easy to find online. And authorities offer a useful uh, help both to machines and to humans because uh, it, uh, they can deliver the exact definition of what you mean, which John deferred you are referring to. Uh, it can enable machine identification, translation and interoperability. And it can help users to find additional information that doesn't fit in, inside your database. You don't have to put everything in your database uh, because that information can be gathered elsewhere. Here's another example of uh, something that is uh, part of a controlled vocabulary. This one is for runic inscriptions, but it's not a unique identifier. This is the identifier for a particular runic inscription found in Uppland. However, if you search for this term uh, online, you will more likely find uh, information about a movie, about the submarine, or the type of submarine that this is about. However, using an authority uh, for the, uh, as well for this runic inscription, not just allow you to explain exactly what you mean, but you, it can also pinpoint to other resources that have information about the same runic in inscriptions. If there are photographs, if there are digitized uh, archival materials or books or any other kinds of information. And an authority can also deliver additional inform information, as I mentioned. 
uh, especially in terms of metadata. So this is metadata connected to this particular runic inscription that explains what kind of material it's made of, uh, where it has been found, exact coordinates, its time period, other kind of identifiers that are associated with it, etc. So what's this good for then? Well, we can do a lot when we have fair data. Uh, we can create, uh, it's possible to create specialized digital solutions using multiple data sources as long as there are persistent identifiers and standardized metadata. Runor is uh, a search platform uh, that was developed by Uppsala University and the National Heritage Board. Uh, it contains information about 7,000 Nordic runic inscriptions that have been found all over the world. Uh, and the content that is shown on this platform is select, selected and aggregated from several different databases and collections that not just contain information about these runes, but also a lot of other information. But on this platform, uh, they are only interested in the runic information. So for instance, it can, uh, using this, uh, this platform, we can show uh, the translations and uh, of this, uh, of these runic inscriptions and the metadata that you saw earlier. It can also aggregate uh, images and archival information that are found in many different sources. And if these sources are updated, then the information automatically appears on the website. So you don't have to double, uh, do double storage. You don't have to double check that everything is, is uh, available. It comes immediately available. And uh, I'm going to very quickly just mention Swedegark that I brought up in, at the start. This is the a national infrastructure for digital archaeology in Sweden that has started uh, development last year and will be ongoing on, uh, until 2027. Uh, it's a consortium uh, with uh, seven, uh, several different universities. Uppsala University is uh, coordinates the infrastructure, but also Umeå, Lund, Karlstad, Stockholm and Gothenburg University are part of it as is the National Heritage Board and the National Historical Museums. And the aim of this uh, information infrastructure is to increase access to Swedish archeological data for interdisciplinary and international research, facilitate data-driven analysis of archeological information from excavation, heritage collections, and scientific analysis, and provide resource for research on heritage and environmental history, planning and sustainability analysis. And you can, see, you can find more information on our website. So I'm just going to, I mentioned this also because uh, Swedegark will be making use of linked data and the FAIR principles to achieve these goals. So the participants uh, in this infrastructure, building this infrastructure, all have their own collections, uh, databases, resources, records uh, that they are both uh, have, have at the moment and are built and are Currently, construction goes from the historic environment record at the National Heritage Board to geodata at Uppsala University, analytical data at Umeå University, 3D documentation, Lund University, and archaeological collection at the History Museums, and a lot of other information as well. So we are collaborating, trying to make sure, implement the FAIR principles and link data on our resources so that they can communicate better with each other. And the information, the metadata and linked data will be delivered to a digital heritage index that will be created by an aggregator, uh, aggregator developed by the National Heritage Board. We have a, an older version of this now and we will be developing a newer version of this aggregator to collect and aggregate metadata and linked data. And this aggregator has all, uh, is also receiving a lot of other information from Swedish museums and archive collections. We have about 83 partners at the moment that are delivering data to this heritage index that we are developing. And we will develop a, a new type of uh, open API so that the information can be used to build these sort of specialized uh, uh, platforms based on the data, but also other ways of, of uh, uh, data output, such as Sparkle, for instance, so that one can do, do data-driven analysis on the metadata. So that's just a po pointing out that working with research information and uh, according to the FAIR principle will become very helpful and very valuable for two infrastructures in the future. So we're going to just move on now to the actual project that Bar Barbara and I and, and several other uh, members of the National Heritage Board's uh, laboratory uh, participated in. And um, so we called it Fair Data for Heritage Science. Uh, 
And the background is, is that uh, we have at the Heritage Board a heritage laboratory uh, that acts as a resource to museums, heritage institutions and universities where researchers and specialists can apply for the use of, of the expertise and the technology available at the laboratory free of charge as long as the projects meet certain criteria and the, on the condition that the results be made open and available to the public after completion. And uh, the Heritage Laboratory is also uh, part of uh, both national and international collaborations, such as Heritage Science Swedish Network and the Iberian HS uh, Heritage Science Consortium in uh, Europe. So it, it's quite important to uh, make trying to make this information and data that they are creating uh, available to to other people. So this has been a bit of a journey. It started way before this project. Uh, they've been working on uh, continuously trying to make this more accessible and useful uh, for different uh, different groups. Uh, reports are, of course, published online. They, uh, there is an internal server for data storage and uh, data has always been available on request. But then, of course, you need to know that there is data available. So. Uh, when we started working with this, the question was firstly, why should we spend why should we spend time on this? What's the value? Is anyone interested in this data? And also, where do I start if I want to do if I want to do this? And we had a preliminary study in 2020, 2021, looking at different platforms and solutions, the, the requirements for laboratory staff, collaborators, the networks, uh, the heritage boards in general, what the fair data principles meant. Uh, if there are good user interfaces for uploading and accessing data, since we are not part of university uh, structures, we are our own government agency. Uh, and we decided to try Synodo because this was a good way of just getting people started and, and looking at how to make data available since it uh, adheres to the FAIR principles with open API and, and uh, open archive initiative. It's run by a trusted organization. Uh, it's connected to a lot of other uh, networks and, uh, and cl uh, cloud services, uh, with persistent identifiers, versioning, has an embargo function. Uh, the Iberian Heritage Science community has, they have their own community on Synodo and the Heritage Laboratory created their own community uh, on, on Synodo. And uh, quite frankly, it was also free of charge. However, there are some cons. If you have to manually add a lot of information, uh, there is limited user support, of course, since you're not paying for anything, and you can only upload one type of data at a time. But it was a good start, at least. So we were looking at this as a way of like, what, what it takes to make uh, uh, data findable and accessible. So, for instance, the use of an identifier for uh, oneself or as an own individual, this is uh, for instance, my name can, uh, is quite common in Sweden, so there are a lot of Osa Larsons out there, but using an ORCID is a way of creating an authority for me if someone is interested in things that I've done. Uh, you can add metadata as free text, which has its own advantages because you are not stuck to a, a formula that you have to, a vocabulary that you have to choose from. You can add your own ones. Uh, but the negative part is, of course, that <laughs> you can do it in any way you want to. But you can also add something called subjects, which is authorities. It's like metadata that actually has a link to an identifier. So it's a good way of trying out both things. Uh, and uh, you can also relate your uploads to publications that are published elsewhere. And you get an authority, a persistent identifier for the upload that you made. So it's easy to uh, cite and reference. So problem solved, we had a technical solution. Well, not really. Uh, Finding a technical solution is uh, far from enough. Uh, there are there were several questions remaining: which data to share, how to prepare data, how to describe data, and the data management templates that we found they were often too general to offer practical, discipline-specific guidance. And we also had the Heritage Board had several compilations of uh, controlled vocabularies for, for instance, heritage. However, they were, they were quite extensive. It was everything uh, was included in there. So it was very difficult for an individual to know, to, okay, where do I start? What's best for me? And some of them were quite frankly, not use, useful for an individual. They were useful for system developers, but not so much for, indi uh, for individuals. So it was a combination of both too little information and too much information. So we were trying to get to something that was just right, a, a little bit more in the middle of this. 
Uh, so in 2022, we got funding to start a research and development project the, at the Heritage Board to investigate how to implement fair principles in everyday practices in a heritage laboratory, identify the most relevant vocabularies for uh, metadata for heritage science, uh, one aim was to curate a list with pre-selected options for common metadata and authorities that the laboratory could use, a guidance to good practice for research data management relevant to the heritage laboratory, and we needed extra help, most of all, what, what we needed to get someone else in to help us and to also have time to spend on this, which is uh, when we looked around for a research data advisor uh, and, and, bought, uh, and thankfully found uh, Barbara, which who fitted just uh, splendidly in this. So that was uh, the real success factor here, I have to say, in the project. And uh, the desired effects of the research and development project was uh, that, the, that the operations of the laboratory would become more discoverable, that it would be easier to reuse and to keep building on the knowledge that they produce. Uh, the things that we learned in this project, we hope could also be support and inspiration to others, uh, such as the Heritage Science Sweden Network and Iperion. And we were also hoping for long-term benefits, uh, making it easier to find analysis and research on cultural historical objects, buildings and sites. So everything we learned from this, uh, this project. So I'm going to hand over to Babs now to tell you a bit more on what actually happened in the project. Right, thank you. Um, so, um, as Osa has pointed out now, uh, a lot of different challenges. Uh, one of them being figuring out what, what's actually needed. How can we make this easier for the people who will be the ones sharing this data? Uh, so, what we decided early on was that um, this, whatever we were going to do, it was going to have to be done in close collaboration with the team, with the people working in the lab. Uh, so, we more or less started out with me, as you can see in this fantastic picture, uh, getting uh, getting to know the people in the lab and what they were actually doing. Uh, so we did some initial meetings one on one with uh, with each of the each of the um, 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 what, what are they called in English, Osa? <laughs> Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, All right, so, you, can, you might write, you can write in the chat. Yeah, you can write in the English. chat. And I, yeah, or Kai, I saw that you're, you're here. So. Let's, let's call it. Specialist, yeah. So basically, uh, to meet with, with, with them and to, uh, to get a case. Uh, from each of them. So we had asked in, in advance to, to like ask them to take out a case of something that they had recently worked with or something that they were actually working with right now uh, that we could continue, that I could look at when I was going to spend the entire summer of last year uh, going through, trying to figure out how we were going to get these the relevant vocabularies and how to put together this the guide and and all of the things that they needed uh, so we um we we got a lot of different uh, uh, cases which were all very interesting interesting and also they show a lot of the variety of the actual work that the lab, lab does which is which is the cool part about it, but also adds to the challenge because it's so many different things that's going on, which makes it really hard to curate a list of vocabularies or terms that can be used because it can be so many different things. So we had like examples of the 18th century furniture, 20th century paintings, medieval silver coins, lots of them, Viking Age shield, uh, the pre-Columbian textiles from South America, um, and also some tests on modern exhibition materials that were helping, uh, that the lab was helping museums with to see if like, can we actually use use this type of material together with this uh, with this Viking Age shield or will it actually destroy the shield if we put this in in the same uh, cabinet uh, so a lot of different things there that was uh, very very challenging um, and we also wanted to we also wanted to include uh, everyone in the project uh, so that it would be um, make the verification of the whole thing as easy as possible because we wanted we also want the, 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 the people, the specialists in the lab to, to know what we were doing. So it was a bit of giving and taking there. So we can hop on to the next uh, slide, please. Um, so what we, what we, as I said, we started out with doing the the one-on-one um, -on -one meetings to get the cases, to talk to them. Um, and then uh, I spent uh, a couple of months gathering information 
putting things together. Um, and then we did follow ups with the lab team uh, right after the summer when everybody came back from holidays uh, to show what we had found, what ideas Os and I had put together. Uh, so what we were thinking we wanted to do just to make sure that everyone was on board with that. Um, we workshopped uh, with everyone to go through their case and how we had worked with it, what I had found on their specific case. So like I found these things that could be relevant. Do you feel that they are relevant for what we um, for, for what you have actually been doing? Have I have I understood correctly what you've been working on? Um, and towards the end of the project, we did a Zenodo workshop. So you've already had a good run through from Osa of like how Zenodo works and what she had, has done with her data set. Uh, so you know the idea of it. Um, but we did it all together as well, just to make sure that everyone felt somewhat comfortable with actually uploading data onto Zenodo because some had tried it and some had not. Uh, and we also discovered the, the nice perk of the fact that you can actually add on to uh, posts that you have already made. So we can hop on to, I think, the next slide um, to show what can be, what could be done. And we should now, we should have had one of these like before and after uh, pictures, but we don't. Uh, so uh, some data sets had already been uploaded. Uh, into this the heritage laboratory community on Zenodo, uh, but then with quite very little uh, metadata added to it. Uh, so we discovered that it was very easy to actually go back into these posts and to add uh, the data. Uh, so also has already mentioned this, how it works with the keywords and the subjects, the fact that the keywords, you can basically write anything uh, that you feel that, okay, someone who would look for my data set would probably search for something like this. And you could just add in those words. Uh, with the subjects in Zenodo, you have these, the authorities, so you have the links, um, which is what you can add. And you, as you can see in, in this uh, data set, I hope you can see, is that we have uh, on the uh, right hand side there, we have a lot of subjects. Objects. Uh, so there has been a lot of links added into uh, this to be able to identify like anyone who would search for these kipus, the, uh, the paracas textiles, threads, the, the materials, whatever uh, we have found, it has been added in there. So it's been made easier to find it. Uh, so during the, in the workshop, people added the metadata, but also after. Um, and as I said, so using both the keywords and the subjects makes it more likely for the data to be found. Uh, because it's uh, if someone just searches for something general, they might touch upon the keywords. But if they know exactly what they're looking for, it's it's more likely that the subjects, uh, the authorities, is what they will, will find. Uh, so um, yeah, so this is what we did with the workshop and how we we uh, sort of tried to, to get everyone on board with with how this was going to work, and mainly to say, to show that it's not it's not actually that hard. It takes a bit of time to get used to, but it's not super difficult. So if we move on to the next slide, we can see uh, a little bit more on this whole thing about the uh, controlled vocabularies that we talked about. And here is one of the things that was a little bit tricky. Uh, one of the challenges, uh, because there are, as also already mentioned, so many different um, vocabularies with authorities. They are very useful for researchers in general, and there are even ones that are very useful for heritage studies in particular. But what is complicated or a little bit problematic for an individual researcher is to choose between them because they all seem fine. And it's very easy to, to get overwhelmed with the information, with everything that's in there. Uh, so no vocabulary will ever include everything that you um, that you will want from it, um, but they tend and they also tend to overlap. So it's like you can find some parts in there, and then you find some of it there, and they kind of overlap, but not everything. But the thing, the good thing is that you can you can have as many different vocabularies in one of these posts as you want. So you don't have to find just one. Uh, so make sure that you pick the ones that are that suits your particular purpose and project best. Um, and that's, of course, the hard part. How do I choose them? So uh, there are a few things to to start with. 
uh, there is, uh, you can start out by searching on uh, viaf.org for terms and you get some suggestions uh, from different vocabularies uh, and you go on from there. Um, we have the Getty uh, vocabularies, uh, which you can see here on the little lists. Uh, the uh, Getty Research Institute, they have different thematic vocabularies that are specifically aimed at heritage and cultural studies. So there are a lot of different ones there. There's not, not just one. Uh, Wikidata is extraordinarily useful because it has everything and it's also very easy to create new ones. So if you, by, by any chance, are working on a particular item or something that you just, you're like, I really would like to have a, a link. I want to be able to link to this and have an authority for it. I know I can describe this object. I know exactly what it is, but it's actually not anywhere. You can make one. So it's really easy to be a, um, a creator on Wikidata. Um, and there are also some specialized uh, ones with, with, that deals with Swedish collections and heritage terms as well. So that's a, a good one. So, but these are a few advanced that we used. I can mention also uh, Mesh, which, which might be me. It's the um, uh, um, medical, and uh, now I forgot the name of it just because of that. Um, I'll, I'll look it up and I'll put it in the in the chat later on. Uh, so basically that one was very useful for the methods because that was one thing that was a little bit uh, off from here. We, we looked a lot at cultural heritage stuff, heritage stuff. Um, and we, we found that um, we, thank you Eva, medical subject headings, excellent. <laughs> It's great to have good people in the in the meeting and in the chat. The thing with the with uh, medical subject headings is that uh, the laboratory, of course, works with um, different methods with instruments. They work with um, 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 photo like different types of methods that are not usually in these cultural heritage um vocabularies so you need to go to like natural science uh, parts to be able to find them so that's when mesh came in that was very useful for us um and i think that that's it for that slide so if we hop on to the next one we'll see what we can do yes um so um when we were we were dealing with the whole metadata uh thing we also wanted to emphasize uh, to our, us, us as well, but also to the people in the lab, to the specialists, that we need to start with good enough. You don't have to, you don't have to do it perfectly from the beginning. You don't have to add all of it at once. And just as some of them had already uploaded the um, data onto Zenodo uh, with little or or uh, done no metadata, fine, then we'd already had posts to work with. So the good thing was that we could just go in there and, and help figure out what could be what could be relevant for this particular data set to put in there. Um, and what we wanted to, to push for are like a few things that were a few terms that were the most important to add in there. And then you could could basically make up whatever keywords that you wanted if you had like, oh, I think they might want to search for this and we can put this in as well. But the, the important ones that we wanted to push for was uh, to have uh, a few subjects like heritage science. Science should always be in there. So that was one of these that we like always put heritage science no matter what, because that's what we do. Um, archaeology, archaeology, quite often art history, literature. Uh, geographical location, almost in any post, it, it would be yeah, I can hardly imagine any where you would not be able to put in a geographical location. Um, materials, whatever it is that you have examined in the lab, it's made of some sort of material. So try and find that in a vocabulary and put it in there. Um, methods. So here we go with the methods again. The microscopy, uh, photogrammetry, um, scanning electron microscopy, uh, x-ray of various kinds, um, lots of different types of photos um, and uh, like UV photo, IR photo, that kind of thing. So um, these methods are also excellent to get in there because someone might just want to look at something done with a certain method. It doesn't really matter what um, object has been, been looked at. They just want to check the method. Uh, also time, style, period, 
so when when it's happened, uh, when it's from, um, and of course a person. If there is a person connected to the object or the project, uh, it could be the artist, it could be the the subject of the entire project. Um, but these are excellent uh, terms to to try and find to start with at least, um, and also to try and find unique IDs for objects. Um, and this is kind of what I talked about when I talked about Wikidata. That if you actually have an object that does not have a unique ID, uh, you can you can more or less make one. But very often, if you work with something that is from a museum collection, for instance, it already has like a an ID um, or similar to that, or like a rune stone. Uh, there are also IDs for those. Uh, so those are quite quite good to put in there as well. So let's go to the next one. And we can look at this beautiful document, this uh, list that we have made. Uh, so this is basically the curated list that was put together for the lab uh, with suggestions of vocabularies um, that are useful. So and this is this is more or less the entire list and it's still I can look at it and feel that it's still quite long because it would have been nicer to be able to narrow it down even more to not make it too complex to try and find the, the subjects that, that you would want, the authorities that you want. Um, but we have really tried to specify uh, what in the comments here, what what would you want to look for in this particular vocabulary um, so that it wouldn't be too overwhelming to try and, and find information here. Uh, so there is a mix of international and Swedish um, vocabularies uh, because quite often it's of course specifically Swedish things that are worked with and then it's very relevant to have these like uh, Kringla or the um, all of these um, once the, the um, um, these ones, but then on the other hand, uh, as I said, Wikidata, uh, excellent. Uh, the UPEC Compendium of Chemical Terminology. Uh, so it's like, yeah, all of these are um, useful in in their different ways. So that's it for that one. I think. Let's go to next slide. Right, and uh, what we did what we wanted to do then. So we put together the curated list uh, of the vocabularies. That was one part of it. But then we also needed this sort of guide to just explain how how are we going to think about this? How are we going to make the data fair? Where do we start? Um, so what we did was to put together um, uh, a guide uh, to make sure that everyone would start to plan for fair data management from the start of the project, because I think that's probably one of the key takeaways from this whole thing is that to make it easier uh, for everyone to make this doable is that you have to think about it. You have to think fair from the uh, from initially in a project. Um, so to make sure that you have good data practices, you want to create and describe your data correctly and to be able to to create your data correct, um, correctly, um, then of course you need to think about the verification process from the beginning uh, and to save and to share in open formats because format is quite important here if you want people to be able to use what you have, uh, what you have produced. Um, to use the vocabularies and authorities, we have already been going on about this quite a long time now, the unique identifiers, uh, and that the document output, uh, that it is structured data, that it's much machine actionable, um, so that it's not just a, a nice Excel file with lots of different colors that doesn't really tell the machine much. So you really need to have to think about the structure of what you uh, what you're sharing um, and also to start planning again from the beginning for making the data available. Uh, so in this case, that's why why Sonoda was chosen so that we know from the beginning that I will at the end of this project or during I will share this in Sonodo and that makes it easier to think about all the other um, all the other points here as well. So um, on the next slide, then we see um, because I didn't feel that we should go through the exact word of the entire guide, but these are basically the headlines uh, of, our, um, of, of, of our guide. Uh, so we, we have focused on uh, the project life cycle, just to make sure that, and that's what you can see, it, the, this is like the life cycle of um, uh, research data in this colorful little figure here. Um, so basically, think about the project life cycle, uh, plan for the creation of your digital data, 
think about your project documentation because it's not only the creation of data. You also have to have documentation that goes with it because you need to be able to remember at the end what you actually were doing. Um, also naming and organizing files. This is quite dry, maybe not that exciting, but it is very important because again, six months or a year later, you will not be able to remember which sample was sample one. So you need to have a system that will tell you what, what why you have named things like this. Um, so that's part of the good practice for data sets and for databases, spreadsheets, and again, spreadsheets, as I said, think about how you work with the spreadsheet and not just like add happy colors. And then that doesn't really say anything. It says something to a human that looks at it. Absolutely, but it doesn't say much to a machine. So. Yeah, uh, so we added in some tips and tricks for fair data. Uh, and that's, of course, what comes next. So the findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data. And then we also uh, talk about open formats, which is again important that we try and use uh, formats that are openly accessible as uh, so open source uh, so that we don't share. I mean, sometimes you might sort of have to, but try and avoid sharing data in formats that can only be opened and read by someone who has access to that specific software that might go along with that specific make of a scanning electron mic microscope. Uh, so it's it's nice if you can share it in some sort of format that any that anyone or at least a lot more people can open. Um, and also licensing because it's very important to also tell the people that finds your data and would like to reuse it uh, that they can actually have the information on how can they reuse it, uh, which kind of licensing. And then we we have like, uh, which we're not really going to go into here, but all the Creative Commons licensing where you can just tell people how how they can reuse and how they can work with your with your data. So yeah, I think that was that for that. And next slide is. Yeah, that's me. So that, I was uh, going to say, I think that's you. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just going to sum up uh, a bit. So just uh, what we're talking about. First of all, uh, not to aim for perfect. Anything is better than nothing. Uh, it's difficult for specialists and researchers because they tend to aim for perfect, which means that uh, things don't uh, often happen that easily. It's difficult. It's extremely difficult to share your data. Uh, I know that myself since I tried it. It's horrible. Uh, and also mostly to see your data. And this is especially for people, they, uh, I think, working within the humanities uh, that don't always understand that they have data, uh, uh, even in archaeology. It's like you, you think of data as data sets, but you need to think about it, that anything that things that you have compiled or created uh, on which you based your published results, your interpretations, uh, they need to be made available, uh, both for reproducibility and for credibility. And to document your material, as Barbara pointed out, to start early, not waiting until the end of it. Uh, what are you doing? Where did this come from? When did you do it? How did you do it? Trying to keep a running documentary on uh, documentation on your research output uh, will make your life incredibly easier at the end, uh, end of a project. And finally, think about how to describe your data. Start compiling uh, a template for yourself with commonly used uh, metadata, terminologies, and, and uh, vocabularies to choose from uh, to think about how to describe your information. So we're going to uh, move over now to just a few final reflections to, to sort of these are more like uh, more more written down results that we uh, we delivered, but there were also lots of things that we learned. We, we made this project because we wanted to learn as well, uh, and it was quite interesting. So some of the things that we looked at was the things that were difficult uh, to find uh, for an individual. Uh, there are a lot of vocabularies. Many of them are stuck behind walls for developers to see, or if you have a certain software, you can access them, but not if you have that soft software. And time periods are still a problem. There are uh, sites such as Periodo that share it. Uh, it's not very easy to use Periodo, in my opinion, and also some of the uh, voc uh, vocabularies have become old and unchanged. But in, and in general, there is a bias benefiting the Western world and uh, especially major civilizations, uh, world, the major world civilizations as well, because of course that's get the art, 
best ones with vocabularies, but they have they created them at, uh, primarily for their own collections to begin with. And even if they have received from other sources, it's it's still a bias. Uh, geographical geographic entities that are culturally defined uh, or time specific uh, can be difficult to find really good vocabularies, especially vocabularies that also show the borders. That doesn't just say Sweden 18th century, but also show the actual borders of Sweden in the 18th century. Or or uh, Sápmi, I've only really been able to find Sápmi uh, in, in Wikidata. And of course, the question is raised, what, what, who decided what the borders were and why and things like that. So it's, it can be difficult with these cultural entities. And cultural historical terminologies in general that are specific to certain regions and time periods, for instance, Scandinavia and uh, an archaeological artifact types in Scandinavia, they are difficult to find good uh, international vocabularies for uh, the translate. And we will be happy to, I will be happy to receive any and all tips you have for me after this. Uh, put it in the chat or email me. Uh, instruments, for instance, technical definitions may de uh, vary depending on use. So that can also be sometimes a bit of an issue for people to decide which uh, vocabulary would be best for them to use. And of course, unique identifier for specific objects uh, in collections. Sometimes there is only an idea for a, uh, identification for a group of objects together. But if you want to pinpoint the exact bone that you made the analysis on and things like that, you need to talk to uh, the collection um, managers and see if you can uh, add, add that and, and increase that information. Uh, and I think that this is one of the most important things. And also to make it easier to find this information would be better. It, it could be that this information exists, but that doesn't mean it's easy for you to find. And that's the other issue. Babs. Yes. <clears throat> so another thing that was a bit of a, a challenge or something that we, we thought about when we were doing this is um, the, the, how people will search. Like if we want to add relevant metadata to the uploads that we do in Sonodo, uh, what we, how how can we know how people search for things, and how can we predict what search terms? Which is of course hard to do, uh, but that also emphasizes the importance of good quality metadata because then you can cover as much as possible. So if you if you do give it some thought, uh, so uh, if you if you do give it some thought uh, and you actually not just add in a couple of random words, uh, but think about this from again from the beginning. If you start planning for whatever metadata you would want to add to your data set when you upload it, when you start doing your project, that will that will ensure that you get at least better quality of it. Uh, which is again, uh, as we've been been saying several times now, adding both the keywords and the subjects to your Sonoda post, which means both the the the, the free text, like add whatever you want, but also the the authorities um, uh, authority posts there. Uh, and to make sure that you do link to a publication or other relevant objects to make sure you use this link data and to use a researcher ID like your ORCID ID or uh, or another one, but just to make sure that it that makes it more findable, basically. So if you do want to get your uh, your data and your research out there, if you do this, then you have a much better chance, basically. Um, and then another uh, on the next slide, we do have um, some other well challenges or what can we do to make sure that this transition will be completed in 2026 that's a hard job for us uh, that are actually teaching <laughs> phd students and and researchers about this but that's basically what we can do uh, we can we can teach uh, we can educate and train uh, young researchers also naturally older ones if they're interested but i think that we actually have to put our emphasis on the younger ones uh, and preferably if we can already at a master's level to talk about these things these things even though it's not required in the same way uh, so and also to make sure that everyone is aware of and that we also focus on the fact that it's important to have good data practice in all fields because as for me as a the, as from the university perspective um we do see that the good data practice or at least the, the sharing of data is more common in certain areas uh, so depending on which 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 subject you're in uh, so it's it's also important to make sure that that we cover this uh, for everyone um but also to train people on uh, security and on uh, law 
because and on the ethics of so all of these three, the last three points here, um, it's important to know like how to store and share sensitive data, what is allowed, what we can and what we cannot share, um, and also ethical questions that needs to be thought about considering research data because there are ethical, ethical questions um, and if you are the more you know about these things the less difficult will it seem uh, so it's like yeah we sometimes it's it's a bit more difficult if you know more about it as well <laughs> but <laughs> but hopefully by 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 training and also um with the increase of data being shared and being requested for every time it happens we will learn more about how can we do this um, and that will make it easier and make it like the normal thing for the future. Uh, so it's still something that is a little bit that people fight, think about as something unusual, that something that we haven't done before, but it is actually the new normal and to get there, we just need to think about these things, I think. Uh, but these are challenges that we're still working with, definitely. So for next slide. Yeah, and the final slide, this is from uh, more from my perspective, uh, working with a uh, government agency and also with, uh, we are working with a lot of museums and uh, researchers at museums and archives. And, uh, and I myself is a researcher outside of academia. And uh, one thing that uh, is very apparent is that even if it's a challenge for researchers at universities to uh, comply with the FAIR, principles it's extremely difficult when you are outside the support system of academia of uh, not being a university employee you, you, you simply do not have the same resources uh, especially museums and archives and nonprofit organizations can be forgotten uh, uh, a bit when there are open science systems being constructed and and for especially for the humanities and social sciences, the the information that is available in this collection is of course that that's our research. Uh, that is our research data. That is what we need to be able to do our research. Uh, but they are often smaller institutions. They have uh, fewer uh, people uh, hired. They cannot have the uh, same sort of support network that a, a major university can have naturally. And uh, so there are some issues that are being raised here. Can, uh, will, what happens? Can they afford the setup required for effective fair processes? Uh, if not, is there a danger of even greater divide between academia and the uh, glam sector, uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museum sector, with the increased demands from research funders that they are uh, demanding uh, uh, a lot of adherence to these processes? and someone need to step up and, and meet that and, and have that support system. So those, those are big questions that, especially in Sweden, a lot of, uh, most museums are not part of universities. You have a few museums that are part of universities, but most of them are not part of universities. Uh, so they, these are big questions. Uh, researchers in general are talking about the added uh, workload uh, adhering to fair principles, but this is of course a, a huge is issue uh, outside of academia as well. Uh, which mustn't be forgotten. There are researchers out there as well. So uh, thank you for uh, listening to us for a full hour.